Hello and welcome to episode 2 of Think Peace with me, Max Burnell. This episode will be continuing with the privacy security debate, but in a slight change to the planned schedule, we'll be hearing from Professor Luciano Floridi. This interview was recorded the first time I met with Luciano in the tranquil surroundings of Oxford earlier this year. He's an impressively intellectual figure whose opinion on almost all matters I admire and respect immensely. He's Professor of Philosophy and Ethics of Information at the University of Oxford and is also the Director of Research at the Oxford Internet Institute. A man of many titles, he's President-elect of the International Society for the Study of Information. He's also Editor-in-Chief of Philosophy and Technology and was formerly UNESCO Chair of Information and Computer Ethics and Research. He was also a Chief Policy Advisor to Google when they were forming the much-debated Right to be Forgotten initiative in 2014. In this interview, we discuss the philosophical implications and nuances of the privacy security debate. We explore what privacy has come to mean in the 21st century and take a look at the tensions that surround digital privacy and national security in an era shaped by the global war on terror. I've learned a lot from talking with Luciano and I find him a fascinating figure and I hope you will too. So, without further ado, here it is, Think Peace, Episode 2, with Professor Luciano Faridi. I hope you enjoy. Okay, so, uh, Professor Faridi, thank you. Thank you for having me. In the digital age, it seems that the information we're willing to divulge has changed quite a bit. Um, you know, people sharing a lot through social media posts uh, and through Google, knowing where they are and everything. Yet at the same time, we seem to be very concerned with government surveillance. Uh, Do you feel our idea of what privacy is has changed? I think the conception, but above all the perception of privacy has changed uh, in at least two fundamental ways. Um, One, we used to think of uh, privacy in the past uh, as something that was really anonymity. Essentially, uh, it's not that we were very private, but we were so many in such big uh, social context, uh, it was like being a leaf in a forest. Uh, the leaf still has a very clear identity, but we are so many. Uh, you won't identify any of us as that particular leaf uh, in, in that particular tree. So we used to have a sense of privacy as anonymity. Then we moved to a context, and then the second sense in which things have changed. Um, into a context where social media has made us perceive our presence online as all uh, major actors or stars of a movie. And uh, when you're on Facebook or Google or Twitter, you don't really communicate, you broadcast. That's a different story. Uh, You're not talking to someone specifically, you're talking, in theory, to the whole universe. And uh, as the star of the movie and the broadcaster, you share as much as you can. I mean, that would be the same as uh, having you know, two actors in a movie uh, in a particularly sort of uh, um, embarrassing circumstances. It's not that they don't care about their privacy, they are acting. Uh, likewise, we feel like we are acting, but meanwhile, this is real life and it's real information about ourselves. So that is why, coming to the second half of your question, uh, this cuts way more deeply than just being online and presenting oneself to the public and therefore sharing as much as one can. Because someone somewhere, either a company or an agency, is going to use that information, is going to uh, uh, mine uh, those uh, data. And that's where security, uh, surveillance, uh, exploitation of data for commercial purposes starts becoming worrisome. Mm -hmm. And um, why is it in regards, particularly in regards to government surveillance, that people seem to be so... Um, why are people so irritated by, by the fact that we feel our governments are spying on us, you know, the snoopers charter and all of this, when we happily give up this information freely in some senses? There are several reasons why we feel unhappy about the government, but not so much about uh, companies. When it comes to companies, we have a sense of um, a, uh, I give you something, you can be something back. Um, I give you my data, that's okay, but at least I get free services and very, no, remarkably very good services. 
we also have a sense that uh, the, there will be a commercial usage, which probably means being bothered by more publicity or the occasional ad that is uh, more or less adequate, but not big deal. When it comes to the government, uh, we have a more opaque understanding of what's going on. We don't know exactly what the government is going to do with the, with the data. And we know that the government is not interested in selling us uh, the new car or a new pair of shoes. His interest in putting people in prisons, his interest in you know, curtailing uh, sort of, uh, potential uh, violence and so on. And so we're worried that we might be caught in the wrong network, uh, understood for reasons different than they are for someone who is not who he is and uh, misidentified. Uh, and I mean, we live in a country where that doesn't happen uh, often and is incredibly liberal. But you can understand in other countries, uh, this can be a, a real, real uh, concern. At that stage, we don't trust the government. We would like to see more transparency. And above all, we would like to see a best before. Now, how long for are you going to run this security or uh, surveillance? Uh, if it is a war, you know, every war comes to an end. Is that exactly you know, the length? of the surveillance uh, uh, project. So uh, more transparency and a clear sense of the time frame would definitely help. Mm. Fascinating stuff. Um, so it, there's a widely sort of considered um, view, and I don't know how much truth there is in this. Um, do you believe that we do need to make a trade-off between our our personal privacy and our security as a, as a nation? And if there is some kind of trade-off to be made, uh, what do you think we've got to consider when we're deciding how we draw the line here? There's always a trade-off, um, and security and privacy are part, for example, of a particular balance that we need to uh, strike. What is unclear is the what for, within which context. We've been here before. I mean, when uh, you are at war, uh, civil ordinary liberties are suspended. But out of a uh, socio-political agreement that the nation is at risk and therefore, for example, freedom of speech has to be handled way more carefully and in a more limited way than it would be in normal days. So when uh, no, no, we were fighting the Nazis, surely we wanted to have a different kind of balance. Today, we are fighting uh, a serious war against terrorism. This has not been clarified. Uh, are there to the voters or by the government to itself, which means that we don't have a war context within which the balance needs to be readdressed. We've just been told, trust us or, or give us this blank check forever. That is not acceptable. What is acceptable is a real effort that comes from bottom up. The, the population saying, yes, for the X number of months, for the next uh, number of years, we want to make this sacrifice, which is sacrificing our privacy, our identity for the sake of the whole nation. Now, we can certainly do that, but we need to be given the opportunity to have a say. We can't be just put in the box and say, oh, trust us, so we're gonna do this for you. No, and total opaque, no accountability, no transparency. That is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. What, in your opinion, is it that polarizes opinion so much in this area between those who advocate uh, the surveillance state and those who demand privacy ag above all other things? I think that because there's a balance here at stake between privacy and, and freedom of speech, uh, uh, inevitably people get a little bit polarized. Now, those who are, for example, on the front line and, and say the security services, uh, the police, uh, um, they see what could be done by having more access to more data. And inevitably they have in mind all the risks, they've seen what can happen when, for example, there's no communication at the European level between the uh, agencies, and uh, we, we've just been through the, the, the Brussels uh, uh, terrorist, terrorist attacks, uh, Paris before, so inevitably they, they tend to want more uh, and less uh, constraints. Meanwhile, people who are worried that this way we're actually losing the war, we're doing exactly what the terrorists would like us to do transform our society into some kind of a dictatorship or with a big brother, a total lack of accountability. Well, they are concerned that we are adopting a self-defeating uh, strategy. The way out is to have a clear sense of what it is for and build consensus bottom up, as you said before. I've spoken to a few people and they seem to think that this either or 
is almost a false dichotomy in a way that it's presented as this sort of how do you feel about that do you think it's a these two things can be uh, taken together or we must choose between one and the other almost like all alternatives you need to see this in a diachronic and like through time perspective if I tell you uh, we have only one option we either go to a Chinese restaurant or we go to an Italian restaurant that is irreconcilable either or but if we have time in front of us well we can go to a Chinese today and not next weekend we go to an Italian we have an agreement now this is a time no, uh, perspective that we need to adopt the, 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 the fight against terrorism for example but we could be talking about uh, corruption we could be talking about the mafia we could be talking about um, uh, tax havens you need to identify your particular battle and tell people how long for at that point, you can find a compromise, and then yes, the either or becomes a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. So you think perhaps it's this, it's this open-endedness of the whole thing that has privacy campaigners so worried. I think it is the open-endedness yeah, that yeah, yeah. gets worried. Uh, the uh, very request of uh, uh, no limits, uh, no question ask, sort of uh, uh, unaccountable. Um, position from which all benefits would uh, would come that uh, is not going to convince anyone mm -hmm. a bit of a different question now I, what role do you think that perhaps the Snowden revelations played in all of this uh, this debate do you think it was healthy for it or um, I've spoken to a few people Professor Anthony Glees for example uh, thought the guy was a traitor should be locked up etc he seems to polarize opinion again I, what sort of role do you think he plays in this debate? He played an immense role because he would have never known how much was really going on uh, without these uh, revelations. So in that sense, I'm uh, actually thankful to him. Uh, we had met online uh, in the past. We're going to meet again uh, at a meeting in Berlin, uh, again online because he cannot come, of course, uh, soon. Um, and I have the highest respect for the moral choice. The moral choice that he made was to uh, essentially be a traitor uh, for the wider good. Uh, someone has to be the um, scapegoat uh, for the rest of the group. Now, as a scapegoat, um, he might be sacrificed should he be going back to the United States. Um, so overall, uh, am I glad that uh, someone like Snowden did what Snowden did? Yes, I am. Mm. Okay. Um, now this is a uh, this is a phrase that gets sort of bandied around quite a lot when people are having this conversation, and you often hear the phrase "If you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear." Now, uh, what would you say about that as as a professor of philosophy? You know, sir. Yeah, I think that that uh, uh, was a, a view that actually has very long roots. People who say that they don't know. But you can find the beginning of that in Augustine. Uh, that's very, very early uh, medieval philosophy, or very late Roman philosophy, depending on how you perceive it. So we're talking about centuries uh, ago. Uh, it's the view that um, uh, as an individual, if you have a clean uh, conscience, surely uh, there's nothing to hide. Now that view is uh, is a misunderstanding uh, for the following reason. Um, Information freezes once on identity. If you see your schoolmate uh, 20 years later and you have lost touch with that person, that person has that frozen picture of you in mind, that idea of you. And you have to spend quite a lot of time saying, I'm a completely different person. I change. I don't do that anymore. I do that. So inevitably, uh, sharing information means fixing the identity of each of us. Mm -hmm. Now, each of us is a work in progress. Living means being open to change. Therefore, fixing the identity of someone is not about whether I do or do not have something to hide, but whether I want to have the malleability, the flexibility of changing. And if you uh, no, sort of freeze my identity at some point, that uh, malleability, that um, availability of change, it's gone. That's why, for example, we want to uh, have a clear start after, say, uh, uh, having been to prison and paid one's debt to society, as the phrase goes, we have a clean start, and that should not be a constraint for being a different person. So it's not about hiding, it's about developing. 
Now, uh, tech companies seem to increasingly trade on um, the security of their data and the level of their encryption. Uh, recently, WhatsApp has turned on by default their str strong encryption for a billion of its global users. And obviously, we, we had the Apple and FBI legal case that happened not so long ago. Um, what is it particularly, why is the reason that we want to be private um, and what is it that we perceive about privacy as being so important to us? So privacy is important for many reasons and they are not mutually exclusive. There's one position in a sense it's what we trade uh, so that we can build special relationships. Uh, if I share that with anyone, that special relationship is in a way uh, watered down. So that's that's a value, for example. The second, which is also perfectly reasonable, is um, in terms of uh, understanding who one is and therefore uh, being able to uh, improve, change, uh, transform oneself. Uh, and uh, privacy means being able to um, safeguard that flexibility uh, of change against any uh, uh, fixation. And that's also incredibly valuable. The third one is, is about who I am and who I want to be recognised as, uh, uh, as, uh, as a person from, uh, socially. And unfortunately we know that when information not only goes out but is sent back to us like a mirror, it actually influences people as well. And that's particularly uh, true for uh, no, you say the, uh, uh, the early stage of our development when we are told who we are by our social circumstances. At that point we, we become who we are told we should be. So you can see that there is lots of reasons for uh, protecting uh, privacy from a personal identity perspective. Now, unfortunately, the debate is often on uh, privacy and my data, as if the data were mine in a sort of ownership, like my car, my house, my information. That is a mistake. Uh, my data, my information is mine in the same way as my hand, my eye, my lungs are mine. They constitute me and therefore the reasons why they should be protected. That's fascinating. So our data is no more ours than our than our shadow belongs to us, or our our footprint in the mud is belongs to us. You know, it's a fallacy really to think of it like that. I think it's a fallacy, and it's a fallacy that comes from uh, a an age where uh, essentially uh, the commercialization of uh, objects, uh, the consumerism, um, leads us to think in terms of things that we do own or we can use. Uh, but actually the, the information we have uh, is, as I said, is in, not in terms of uh, possessing something, but in terms of uh, uh, emanating uh, uh, in, the, in the wider world our own self. So certain things uh, belong to me just oh, accidentally or by convention, including my name. Some of the things like my most uh, uh, precious memories well, I want to share them only with some people and they shouldn't be accessed by anyone, no matter what. So we have to reshape the debate about what goes out there, which would be like, say, having my hair uh, shortened or have my hair cut and then uh, someone, say, sells the hair to someone else, that's fine. Or no, my own intrinsic identity, which would be, no, for example, for someone could be um, their uh, um, sexual orientations that may or may not be so constitutive or who you are that you may not want to share with anyone else. Fascinating stuff, okay. Um, now, Amnesty International recently uh, publicised the fact that they feel encryption is a human right, or the, rather the right to be able to communicate completely privately is a matter of human rights. Do you have sympathy for that position? Or? So, um, talking about rights is always a bit uh, tough because um, uh, there's always although not necessarily, but the tendency of looking at duties as a counterpart. Now, if a right is a right uh, that doesn't have a counterpart in a duty, uh, then becomes a little bit of a hollow uh, right. I might have a right to be happy, but if nobody has any duty to make me happy, well, no, you're welcome to uh, this miserable world. So it's a bit of a, a rhetorical move, but doesn't really uh, have any traction. If, on the other hand, the duty is there. So the right that we're talking about is a right that has a duty as a counterpart. So someone has the duty to make sure that things go in that particular way. 
uh, so I have right to say freedom of speech so there is a, at least a negative duty on the other side not to block me when I want to express that uh, then I think we are, are talking about a huge burden on society and perhaps an, uh, too early uh, days I like the idea of seeing uh, privacy as a top priority in our so, civil rights but a right to privacy um, without any further qualifications it's it may be dangerous okay um, okay so uh, following on with a little bit more of the encryption stuff uh, should anyone really be able to mute to communicate completely secretly if we're living in a world you know that um, in which such private channels might be used um, against us or to harm us should anyone really have the ability to uh, communicate entirely privately should there should you be able to go dark I believe the Americans call it um, so is this a danger to us or is it a freedom that we should try to protect I think private and potentially therefore encrypted communication should be the default uh, that will be the normality but in the same way as it is normal to walk from the office back home and expect nobody you know, to you know, pick you up and put you in a van and run you to the police station that is not the world in which we want to live uh, certainly it's not the world in which we live in this country at the same time we know that even the most fundamental radically fundamental rights that we have always cherished uh, since the alignment onwards uh, come with uh, circumstances and, and conditions people can be put in prison uh, so freedom of movement can be restrained for of use and good reasons so I would like to see uh, the new balance that we're going to reach uh, I hope soon such that um, the, the uh, right to encrypted um, uh, privacy can be um, overcome in special circumstances. Now, those special circumstances have to be uh, decided transparently by the judiciary. It cannot be just a, you know, a, a default position whenever the police wants, whenever, because that's what we do not expect in other contexts. Now, the police cannot search my house without a warrant. Likewise, shouldn't be able to break into my so, uh, smartphone without you know, uh, someone somewhere having the whole procedure in place uh, respected. But should the police at some point for you know, national um, uh, security uh, do that? Well, I hope we will find a solution for that to happen. Now, the FBI-Apple um, debate uh, was not about this. Uh, it was about a uh, commercial uh, stance on Apple's side and a political stance on FBI uh, position. So, uh, inevitably, the real debate has been hijacked by essentially commercial slash political sort of uh, interest. But the social interest, which has been uh, overseen, uh, is there. We would like to live in a society where, in extreme circumstances, even the right to have a private communication should be something we can overcome if it is the interest of the whole you know, society uh, to do so. Mm. Fascinating stuff. Uh, I, I was speaking, as I say, I, I spoke to a cryptologist, and he said one of the issues with this whole um, allowing... Uh, some people access or this backdoor idea is that once a backdoor exists then it you people who might wish to us harm can exploit that backdoor building an inherent weakness into encryption is very dangerous thing to do um, so that's going to be a, a quite a big challenge for us as a society yeah, I think that, that, that is to... true and and I think that we can find technical ways of making sure that that is as safe as possible but compare this to the following uh, reasoning oh, we shouldn't have doors that lock too well because otherwise the police could not enter the house uh, when in fact no, they need to enter the house no, with a warrant. Well, surely, no, th that is doable and worst scenario, the police crashes the door. So with a warrant, not every day, not just by default, not as a yeah. normality. There's the exceptional, extraordinary case in which you need to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, the FBI case and it was, wasn't so dramatic because we didn't have no, the iPhone of say a terrorist thinking there might be the plot of the next terrorist attack in it and that's why we could have the debate because if that had been the case trust me we would have had no debate that uh, iPhone would have been cracked the next hour so uh, it's a bit disappointing to be honest that uh, no, such an important issue has been reduced to no, as I said commercial political reasoning. yeah 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 it's uh, okay um, 
So more of a philosophical sort of line of thinking now, I think. What is it particularly about surveillance that people perceive as such a threat? Um, and moreover, it does... Does us being aware that we are being watched alter our behaviour? So surveillance has a, has a bad name for obvious reasons. I mean, that's what the European history has taught us, at least. You know. uh, all dictatorial regimes love surveillance. Uh, Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, uh, the fascist Spain, the colonists in, in Greece, on and on and on, the Stasi in, in uh, the, uh, East Germany, etc. So we have had such bad experience uh, that uh, we're worried immediately. Why? Well, because um, surveillance is meant to be secret, otherwise it's not really surveillance. Um, in fact, the name surveillance is, um, is a misname, uh, because surveillance, uh, to be seriously uh, as such, it should be invisible. Uh, it, it is a pre-Snowden surveillance. After Snowden, you should change name, it's monitoring. Is the difference between the big yellow uh, camera on the street that is there to make sure that you, know, you don't speed, uh, you don't travel too uh, too fast, uh, and um, and the police hiding to make sure that they catch someone uh, invisible. So the reason why surveillance is therefore uh, such a negative uh, thing in, in the minds of everybody almost is past experience and um, and the fact that information has been misused on a regular basis by powerful forces, forces that can essentially exercise violence legally, um, to uh, um, make sure that political uh, dissidents uh, did not uh, have a voice, uh, to make sure that uh, people would be nudged in the right direction, uh, elimination of a variety of uh, uh, civil rights, so it has a very bad name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and, and is there any truth to the fact that it does, even whether we're being watched or not? I think it was, was it the Panoptican? Uh, is, I'm, not, I'm not very well read on this subject myself, but is there any truth to that sort of idea, that the fear so. of I mean, being if, watched? If, yeah. um, if one is observed, uh, inevitably one becomes um, immediately a bit self-conscious, more or less. Um, if I know that I'm being watched, I might be uh, behaving slightly differently, more artificially. Uh, I might try to adapt myself to what I think the picture in the mind of the person that is watching looks like. So I might try to adapt myself to whatever he's uh, monitoring on the other side rather than being myself. So I would in the long run, artificially modify my behavior, uh, my taste, uh, my habits, uh, and that ultimately infringes on my freedom. So I, I will not longer be entirely free to be who I think I should be or I would like to be, but I would like to uh, sort of fit within whatever patterns I think is an acceptable pattern. That's why in a small village when, where everybody uh, watches, mm. there are always public virtues and vices are just private as the uh, phrase uh, goes. Uh, if we escalate that to a, a global village, then we would have a whole population acting as if someone is constantly watching and therefore trying to make sure that one is in line with what is expected rather than trying to develop one's own private uh, interest and, and inclinations. That is not uh, in line with not the defense of uh, individual freedom as we know it. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Okay, um, so I, uh, is it correct that you you had a role as a Google advisor during the the right to be forgotten, um, and and how does that tie in with this whole idea of privacy? Is so I'm uh, I'm a member of uh, uh, Google's advisory uh, board on the right to be forgotten, and uh, I'm the only philosopher ethicist uh, in, uh, on the board. Uh, our job is now uh, complete. Uh, we issued uh, our advice, and as far as I know, Google uh, took it uh, on board. Things have developed, of course, since we advised Google, uh, so the technology has changed uh, slightly. There have been developments also on the legal side. Um, the particular debate uh, uh, in this case is no longer security uh, versus privacy, but it's freedom of speech versus privacy. And uh, in this case too, uh, there's a balance uh, to strike. Um, 
Once again, it's complicated because the, the privacy in question is about information that is legally available uh, out there. So the debate was whether Google was uh, uh, going to be allowed to link any uh, legally available information out there or not. Unfortunately, you know, things have changed dramatically since good old days with books and, and, and newspapers. And today, uh, a lot of the information that is okay from a legal perspective to be out there should also be left alone, should be left to sediment. Mm -hmm. um, something that the analog world now knows by default, but the digital doesn't. Uh, the digital is 24-7 and it's a long, long, long front page. Mm -hmm. you, never, you never turn page, it's always there uh, indefinitely. So we had to find a solution to make sure that this would happen. And I think that allowing people to remove links when the information, although legally available, is also harmful or has become harmful or kind of freezing ones to a past that is no longer representative is an important step forward. Mm. Fascinating stuff. Okay. Um, now, in, in regards to the investigatory powers bill that's, I believe, currently going through committee stage, um, it's going to give new surveillance powers um, require internet service pr providers to keep connection records and it will require tech companies to as far as they can uh, assist in decrypting uh, information. How effective do you believe this is really going to be in a sort of globalised society? You know, um, how, how powerful are local powers in the global village? So locally um, it may or not may be very effective uh, in terms of our, our bigger schemes, uh, larger issues. Um, it might help to catch the occasional small fish, but the uh, bigger sharks uh, will simply operate elsewhere. Now look what happened in Belgium. Now they, they knew that there was a weakness there and that's where the terrorists uh, organized themselves. So um, I'm not sure that it does more than pushing people to break into a different house rather than you know, mm -hmm. our own here, which will be already a little bit of a uh, success. But what uh, concerns me most is the open-ended nature of this. Uh, it shouldn't be. Um, if this is a war, uh, we need to know how long it's going to last for. So something like this, I think, would be received in a very different way if we were to come with for the next 12 months, for the next 18 months, even to say for the next five years. Mm -hmm but we would have best before. Uh, then we will know that we can reassess, we can change our minds. But once it's fixed in, in, uh, in the law of the country forever, uh, I would be very concerned and I would not be in favour. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's, uh, it's again this slippery slope argument, isn't it? When you start on a road like that, it's very hard to, to work your way backwards. Yes, indeed. That's why it should be in itself have a best before. It should, in, in a way, come with a horizon of uh, applicability after which it decays. You know, it's immediately invalid, say six months, 12 months, because we could also check whether it's of any value. I mean, nobody has yet uh, been able to show that all these restraints of civil liberties is delivering any real good. Now, when you have a real war, uh, you can see that. I mean, maybe you no know, airplanes have been shot down. Uh, the, um, the press is playing a big role in supporting uh, the, the, the armed forces and so on. But in a war against terror, unless we are given more in terms of uh, even vaguely understanding what good effect all these sacrifices on the civil side have uh, achieved, well, it's just asking for more without giving anything back. And that is not good policy. Mm -hmm. And in re in regards to just as a side note, <laughs> yeah. in in regards to the war on terror, you know it's this um, it's it's not a war in any way that we've previously known it. it it's a war and almost a, a a concept or an ideology almost, and perhaps it, it it might suit some people for there not to be a real way of winning it. You know, it's it is a perpetual state of war. That's what one may easily suspect. Mm. It's convenient uh, to um, wave this sort of uh, scaremongering, which is really you know, like terrorist uh, perspective, to make sure that uh, the state becomes a little bit more sort of uh, uh, right wing, a little bit you know, uh, more enforcing. Uh, now, this is uh, is a dangerous slippery slope. 
And that's why I insist on knowing exactly what am I making a sacrifice for and how long for. If I don't know what for and how long for, you're not going to get me on board, inevitably. Me as the, no, uh, the, the ordinary citizen. So, no, for a government, if I could recommend anything to you know, uh, our politicians, is tell us clearly what for and how long for, and we will join you. Uh, you know, there will be a spirit uh, that is you know, proud of this nation, of being able to make sacrifices when the time comes. But without being told what for and how long for, I mean, this is uh, uh, it's open-ended and it's vague and it's opaque. It's bad policy. I, I think bottom line just for us, I mean, oh, if you want to use it for the interview, it doesn't matter, but somehow this war on terror has been badly sold, if I can put it away. Has been put in a way that uh, we become suspicious towards those who are supposed to protect us, as opposed to being all united against those who are trying to kill us. Mm -hmm. That is, no, <laughs> if anything, is the biggest mistake Western governments have made so far. But that's why it requires Snowden to not uh, open the, 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 the issue. Um, and when people say, oh, it should be uh, treated as a criminal or as a uh, traitor, well, we owe him a lot. I mean, and I'm sorry, the, the, uh, surely people have paid for that, for, for, for his uh, um, sort of, uh, disrespect for the rules of the game. But at some point, this had to be uh, addressed. And I'm very happy that we're addressing it now, as opposed to you know, five years or ten years and so on. Mm -hmm. So the very reason we're having this interview is also because Snowden, Snowden yeah. has been around. Now, not an easy no, position to, to hold. Um, and I'm not, again, just for us, I'm not optimistic. Mm. I don't think that our politicians are sufficiently insightful to understand what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're more worried uh, about the backlash of, say, the next terrorist attack than uh, being, so in a sort of Churchill perspective, promise all those sacrifices because victory is at the end of it. Um, unfortunate, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this is a thought that's just occurred to me, so um, apologies if it's not very yeah. articulately yeah. asked, but um, I, when I was speaking to the, the uh, um, the Privacy International people. <clears throat> uh, it came up through the questions that it's very difficult to sort of when when you're ar arguing for freedom and privacy uh, in your information and your communications. It's very difficult to avoid making the statement that almost the occasional terrorist attack is a price that we have to pay. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's some truth in that, or is there any way around that? But well, there's um, there's some truth in it. Um, it's not something that we want to say too loudly, because uh, there's suffering and uh, and human lives at stake, and even one single human life is too precious to be sacrificed for any sort of social good. So that's a matter of fact. But the problem is that. Uh, the measures we're taking are so restrictive, they are undermining so much the foundations of our sort of liberal democracies and our civil liberties that we might actually be playing in the hands of the terrorist. Now, if you think in terms of how many people have died uh, from terrorist attacks uh, in Europe, just in Europe, it's incomparable just to one single war that we've been uh, uh, going through mm -hmm. in the past 20 years. Uh, the first uh, Iraq war, the second Iraq war, Afghanistan, yeah. way more people have died mm -hmm. there than in any sort of uh, associated numbers of, of terrorist attacks in Europe. Now this is not a body counting kind of uh, uh, ethics, it, has, it doesn't work that way. But it does give a bit of perspective in terms of what kind of effort we should be making. And that's why I'm, I'm very much uh, surprised by the fact that we, you know, for example, we went to Afghanistan when it was, it was kind of obvious that once Afghanistan was going to be left to itself, we'll, go, we'll be going back exactly mm -hmm. where it was. Mm -hmm. 
and all those lives and all those resources will be spent uh, and uh, all those sacrifices that I'm, human suffering would have been almost pointless. That is heartbreaking. I mean, mm -hmm. when we know that something else can be done. So I'm in favor of, of two hands, two policies. We should have one hand uh, is should be as strong as possible. So I'm in favor, for example, uh, and I hope you will not be disgusted, uh, to uh, state killing. If we have some special troops, they identify a terrorist, I'm very happy for them to shoot on sight. Mm -hmm. No question asked. The left hand, the other hand, we should be as protective of our society as we can possibly be violently moderate. In other words, civil rights protected almost at any cost, including the risk of being attacked again, because there will be the other policy. You see, so both at the same time. But we can sort of swing like a pendulum, sometimes very, very strong, sometimes very, very weak. There's a weakness that is strength, and that's the defense of our no, civilization. And there's a strength that has to be essentially almost immoral. And that is a war against terrorists that has to be almost like a terrorist. Mm -hmm. We're not, we don't have a state to declare war to. So if that's the way they operate, we should adopt similar measures, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So it's a very difficult question, but we have to we have to address. There are difficult questions in this world. It, and it's the new normal, as they say, uh, yeah. and uh, and that's why I'm not terribly concerned when uh, when people say, "Well, uh, should the uh, no, special forces CIA so, uh, identify the next commander?" And uh, if that, and it's a big if, but if that is the next commander, that is the uh, bomb planning. Oh, please, no, yeah, yeah. go and shoot now. Okay, so. In, in sort of summary of some of the things we've been speaking about, uh, in your opinion, what are the sort of ethical and uh, philosophical considerations when we're trying to go forward in our, our thinking about this subject of privacy and security and terrorism? What are the main things we should keep in mind when we're looking at these decisions, in your view? I think in terms of long-term perspective, we should be looking at the kind of society we're living as a uh, uh, legacy or inheritance to future generations. The, the information societies that we are building right now are very young, very malleable. Uh, we can send them in one direction or another. We're getting out of uh, the sort of liberal democracies, uh, old-fashioned, party-oriented, uh, union oriented sort of kind of policy, politics we are inventing a new game as we sort of are playing it I think the major uh, risk that we're running is that we're doing this without what I like to call a human project we're moving forward without having a clear sense of where we would like to go mm. uh, so it's all about reacting to the problem here the crisis there it could be the financial crisis a terrorist attack the GDP going down, uh, the steel industry not, not, not being uh, com commercially viable, but it's a constant reaction as opposed to having a sense of where to go. So whenever you are distracted, then you know where to go back yeah. because that is the direction. So you can be distracted by this and back and by that and back. But this direction of what kind of, a, say in the UK, what kind of information society we want to build, I think is lacking. And that seems to me, although I know I understand this kind of a philosophical perspective, but without that long-term strategy in the next 10, 20 years, where we want to be, say, in at the end uh, of 2050, that is what guides decisions now and therefore can also put frames, constraints, what we said before, and what for and how long for. Mm -hmm. That sort of goal determines all the steps. The steps we're taking now, we're being pulled and pushed all over the place. That is not politics, that is management. So there you have it. I hope you found that conversation as intriguing to listen to as I found it in person. Luciano has a strong online presence and puts out a lot of essays and articles that I really would highly recommend you check out. Just Google his name and go explore. Next time, with the last programme to focus on digital privacy issues, we'll be hearing from Professor Marianne Franklin. Marianne's Professor of Global Media and Politics at Goldsmiths in London, 
and we'll be discussing the role of media and politics in the digital privacy and national security debate, so stay tuned for that. If you want to get in touch, send an email to contact.thinkpeace at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at think underscore peace or Facebook at Think Peace Podcast. And of course, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on SoundCloud and YouTube and get liking and sharing. Thanks for listening and until next time, take care. Thank <laughs> you.